So I want to jump back to uh, the sort of as- the employment aspect of things. And you talked a little bit about how you you found your team and and your 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 researchers and so forth. But and we also talked about how difficult it is to kind of get experience when you're just starting, mm-hmm. or or even to sort of show that experience to people who might potentially be hiring you. So what are people who are hiring in digital forensics looking for in candidates? And how if you are trying to apply for these type of positions, do you show yourself to be an above average candidate and sort of float to the top of the pile? Um, so for me, I always encourage people and the people that I've noticed the most are the people who are active on LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a really great free way for you to get involved in conversations and, you know, just liking, posting and, and commenting on things is a great way to get noticed. And, and all of a sudden you're, you're noticing somebody who's passionate and interested and you connect with the right, we're all on LinkedIn, to be honest with you. Um, right. You know, like, I mean, people in the industry. So if you want to yeah. connect free, it's a great way to do it. Um, and those are the people that I've tried to work with. So uh, before COVID shut down, I was looking at a more um, immediate plan to expand the US. And I had a couple of uh, associates that were not full-time employees, but if I needed them in, in a particular area, uh, I had a contract with them so I could use them. And so they were sort of associates of the company. Um, and particularly Felicia Newton um, just caught my eye as somebody who was doing so much to sort of mm. kick down doors and get into the industry. And for me, I thought, if this is somebody who wants this kind of position so badly, I want to be working with her and develop her skills. And, you know, unfortunately, we've had to kind of scale back a little bit and move away. So um, she understands that very professional um, I also tried to expand into Toronto earlier this year for the same reason I had to kind of scale it back. But, um, you know, my employee at the time, Ramya, Ramya Regavan, uh, she connected with somebody that I'm close to in Vancouver. They put me in touch and just to sort of guide her career, um, sort of like the advice that I'm giving now. And when I met her, she was so passionate and she was just so willing to learn and just the kind of professional that I wanted to develop that I actually put her through the InfoSec training. Mm-hmm. Um, despite her not even being an employee, I just wanted to help her. And, um, you know, she just, she sank her teeth into that and really, you know, attacked it. And I thought again, wow, this person's so passionate that I, I made her an offer for um, a full-time position in, in Toronto, um, which unfortunately we had to scale back in. So she's moved on to another opportunity and I wish her all the best, but that's the kind of thing that I look for. And Rami had an excellent IT background. She worked as sort of Um, an IT person. So she was very aware of the technology that we deal with. She was very good with communicating verbally and in writing and just the passion. So speaking of, of difference between your, your Vancouver office and your Toronto office and so forth, how has, has, has COVID and and lockdowns and working from home and so forth affected forensics in general and your company specifically? Do you have uh, multiple teams in different cities? Do you try and stay central? Do you, how, like how close how closely do you meet? I'm sure it's not face to face right now, but like how how tightly knit do you you have to be in 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 the work right now? Um, so our team, if we have to be in the lab to use the technology and and plug drives and switch dongles for various software that we use, that's that's important. And we're there regularly, but sometimes you can set something up. If you're doing a multi day investigation, they're just using Team Viewer and remoting in, which is really cool. Um, in terms of collecting the evidence, we actually, we're pretty stationary in Vancouver here now. Our, our team and our office in the lab is set up here in Vancouver. Um, even when we're hired by people within the city limits, they still send the devices to us by courier. Um, we're never going, we're, we're very rarely going on site to collect the evidence from, from lawyers and things like that. We get them sent from their clients or the law office. Um, so there's no magic to being on the ground, but sometimes there's an urgency uh, or a particular file that does require somebody to be on site. So that's why I was trying to expand into Toronto because occasionally people um, either required us to be there or they weren't comfortable currying an important piece of evidence to us. And I understand that, but in the vast majority of cases, it's perfectly fine. And with couriers, we can keep track of, you know, through the um, the records that they keep chain of custody, which is always important for evidence and going to court and things like that. Um, so yeah, the, my, my plan from day one with this company was to be really efficient and paperless and um, have a smaller operation so that we can pass that value along to our clients. Uh, it's a very expensive field if you're actually a, a, somebody who uses the service. It's so specialized that mm. the market demands that you, I mean, the tools you have to use, the liability that you incur if you do it wrong, um, you know, you can't water down your fees. 
at the same time, we're very focused on providing value. Um, so before somebody goes down the expensive road of, of hiring somebody like us, that's why I have these talks up front. So they know not only all the great things that we can do, but also some of the ways that, you know, there's a risk here that this might not materialize. And, you know, here's the challenges that we might face in a particular case. And, you know, if you want to take that risk, we're happy to do the work, but you have to understand fully the benefits and the, the risks of, of our work. New episodes of the Cyberwork podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central. And don't forget to check out our hands-on training series, Cyberwork Applied. Each week, expert InfoSec instructors teach you a new cybersecurity skill and show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. Go to infosecinstitute.com learn. Stay up to date on all things Cyberwork.